All right, welcome to the next step in 10 steps to renew your energy. This is step number three, reduce your stress, and in parentheses, hormones, because that's exactly what we're going to be talking about, is how you can reduce your stress, and especially your stress hormones, and what that means, because stress is a response, and it's a hormonal response. So I'm going to go through that response how your hormones shift and change, how stress is really a good thing overall, but how chronic stress leads to an increased risk of disease and what you can do on a daily basis to take action steps to mitigate that stress response. So if this is the first webinar that you've tuned into, this is step number three of 10 steps to renew your energy. Step number one was eat a real food diet. If you're not eating a real food diet, then you're trying to walk before you crawl or run before you crawl. You have to start there and with step number two, exercising regularly. Those two are a foundation. And now these are specific steps for energy, but these first three webinars, these first three steps, they can be the first three steps towards anything in your health reducing your sugar, reducing your additives and bad fats and inflammatory foods, very basic first step, uh, starting to exercise regularly, very basic second step, and reducing your stress. There is not a person in the world that can't take these three steps and move in the right direction with their health. So I'm really excited to bring you today's topic, reducing the stress hormones. Because even for people who, you know, energy is not a concern, uh, but maybe you just, you know, have come to our office or have come to our website or have found this on YouTube or something, for any various health condition, they're going to get a lot out of today's webinar. So this is not specific to energy, but at the same time, if you feel like your energy is lacking, you want to boost your energy, you're not going to be able to do it without this step. And, and the next thing I want to mention, too, with this is these are basic stress reduction techniques. Like on a daily basis, we're going to explain, explain stress physiology, explain some of the hormonal responses, and explain the things that you can do. But for a lot of people, there is a next step. We're not going to talk today about HPA axis testing, about adrenal fatigue and adrenal burnout, and how that can be tested, how that can be measured, how that can be supported. We're going to talk about things on a daily basis that you can do. If you have been under chronic stress for just too long, it will affect your adrenal glands and what's called your HPA axis. It will create bigger problems than just you know, low energy, it will create adrenal fatigue, which is unusually low energy. It can create autoimmune conditions. It can create, you know, tired all the time or chronic fatigue syndrome. It can create other problems like thyroid issues. It can create a whole cascade of problems. And stress really is at the root of a lot of our disease processes. Today's webinar will be geared towards those people who, who maybe have a diagnosed disease, but episode number seven, step number seven, is going to dig a lot more into supporting the adrenal glands, testing and measuring this through some lab testing, and really getting into you know, the rhythms of your adrenal hormones and your stress hormones. But the first thing that I want to point out and pull up my slideshow here again is, you know, are we stressed today? You know, and that's almost a stupid question, because in today's society, we are incredibly stressed. It's just a, an everyday part of life. Um, we have a go, go, go society. We have you know, different things that, that creep up. That's what we're gonna talk about too, is um, you, you know, what are the different stresses? What, you know, what has changed in our reality today or in our, in our lifestyle today to make those things? But are we stressed? Absolutely, stress is a normal part of life today. And that doesn't mean that it's a good thing. Just because everybody around you, just because it's a very common thing, does not mean that it is a good thing. So it's one of the reasons that disease is also a very normal part of our life today. You know, overweight and obesity has become the norm. Taking a medication in adulthood has become the norm. So we look around us and we see these things being so common that we make the mistake of thinking that they have to be normal and they're not normal it's a common part of our lifestyle today 
but it's not necessarily normal. But what are the different stressors that we have? Well, uh, like when they pull people, you know, the number one thing is their jobs, you know, um, the work that we have to do and, and our purpose on this earth. Uh, that leads to stresses about our, our finances. You know, we, in our country, you know, we have a negative savings rate. We spend more than we save. So a huge stressor, your bills, your paycheck, your, you know, everything that has to do with finances is a huge stressor. Your relationships, and how about, you know, linking those first three together? Your job is what provides you with your finances, and if your finances aren't in line, it will stress a relationship. It's the number one cause of divorce or financial disagreements, but relationships are also a cause of stress. World news, how about that one? You know, today uh, we have different things going on politically, we have different things going on globally, and, and people just get so worked up about it. You know, it could be something that's happening that really has, has no impact on you or your family, uh, but we still get so stressed about it and we still have the stress response. And that's what we're gonna talk about, is how stress is a response. But world news is a big one today. You know, we've had, you know, relatively recently, we've had an election. And, and just think about, like, reading the comments on Facebook and things like that. Do you, do, can you see that people are stressed? Can you see that they are getting angry? Can you see that they are getting offended and getting defensive? And you can just see and hear the stress, even on social media or talking to your friends and family. It's a huge stress today. And it really... You know, not the election maybe, but a lot of the things that we get stressed over, you know, how much impact are they really going to have on your life as opposed to things that you can take control over? There's a lot of things that you can take control over on a daily basis rather than react to things that don't, you know, affect you that, that largely, maybe in the grand scheme of things they do, but not today and tomorrow. World news technology you know that's a big stressor and you might think well my gosh my technology is a uh, you know it, it's a stress manager it actually helps me decrease stress helps me manage my schedule helps me be able to send an email from my phone but no we are constantly so go 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 with our technology and think about this if you're sitting out at lunch with a friend and, and your phone buzzes or their phone buzzes what is the you know knee jerk reaction? It's it's to grab that phone, and if you don't, it's really really hard not to because we're trained, we're conditioned, we're programmed to be so addicted to our technology, and, and so that is one cause of stress. Just I mean, looking at the screen, looking at the blue light that we see coming from our screens, a uh, huge cause. But then just the constant addiction. The constant addiction and dopamine rush when we get a phone buzz, we get an Instagram update, we get a text message, we get that little buzz. And it's really no different than, you know, a cigarette smoker getting a little hit uh, of a cigarette. They get it immediately. It satisfies that craving and that addiction. And in your brain, it's absolutely no different. And if you want to learn more about that, one of the upcoming webinars is about your neurotransmitters. You're talking a lot more about how, uh, how those neurotransmitters work, how addiction works. But yeah, our technology, a huge, huge, huge stressor today. And just our go, go, go environment. That is just our culture today. It's just go, go, go. If you're not moving, you're being lazy. And that is just, that's the way that we're programmed and the way that we are conditioned today. So I wanna talk about stress, you know, just in and of itself. Uh, as whether or not it's a good thing or a bad thing. Because this is a really important concept um, it, it, because stress is a good thing. And, and hear me out on this. You know, most of those things also are, phys or excuse me, are mental stressors. That's what we're gonna talk about a lot today is your mental stressor because you have more control over the way that you respond mentally to a stressor and how you treat that, how you think about that. I use the analogy in the initial webinar, 10 steps to renew your energy. When we were talking about this step, step number three, reduce your stress hormones, I said stress is a response. And you can take you know, two, two kids getting the same grade on a test. They both get a C. And one is ecstatic about that C. 
and one is just heartbroken and crushed about that. See, so same result, but the way that they've been programmed and the way they've been conditioned elicits a different response. Likewise, somebody could get a flat tire and they can just it can just ruin their day, or somebody else could get a flat tire at the same time and think, okay, well, you know, I got I got a flat tire. It's no fun, but I'm gonna fix it. I'm gonna move on with my day. I'm gonna continue moving forward. That is a response. And so a good example is you know, working out, you know, if I want to build a bigger arm, I have to stress that arm by lifting weights, right? And the stress creates growth. So we don't want a completely stress-free environment. That's a no growth environment. We need to be stressed in order to grow, in order to mature, in order to change. We need to get out of our comfort zone. But the problem is today is that we are overly stressed. So I don't want you to think of stress as a bad thing but I want you to think of too much stress as a bad thing. So not all stresses though are mental. Uh, and all those last ones, you know, those are all mental things that, that we think about. Except for the technology, you know, that does have some, some more stresses to it just on your eyes and, and things through the uh, EMFs, the magnetic or uh, electromagnetic frequencies that are coming out of there. But stress is not only a mental thing. Stresses can be mental and emotional, which is the most common. That's what we think about. If I ask people, hey, are you stressed? Their, their answer is only determined on what they think their mental or emotional stress level is. But stress can also be physical stress. Sitting at a desk is a huge physical stress. Getting in a car accident, getting in a whiplash, having an injury is a huge physical stress. They've taken, and then you can have toxic chemical stress. They have taken uh, Olympic athletes and, and made them sedentary for a day. And in a day, they can notice their hormones begin to shift towards stress physiology. So being sedentary, being seated, huge stressor, sitting at a desk or a computer with your head shifted forward, huge, huge stressor. You know, I wrote a, a blog article that was a review of an article written by an orthopedic surgeon. And long story short, he said that when uh, your head is looking down at 45 degrees, so you're know, looking at your devices, looking at your book, looking at your work, when your head is tilted down at 49 degrees, it adds an average of 49 pounds of weight to your head and neck. And he's talking about as an orthopedic surgeon how this is increasing the chances of surgery down the road because it's wearing and tearing on the joints of the spine, something that I you know, take very, very seriously. But he said that the average high schooler spends 5,000 extra hours in that position. So that is not only a stress on the joints, on the muscles, on the ligaments, but that causes a stress response in the body. So you can have mental stress, you can have physical stress, or you could have toxic chemical stress. And that was really important too to realize that if you, let's say you have a very calm mindset and a very stress-free lifestyle, and you exercise and you stretch and you do yoga regularly, and you're addressing your mental stresses, you're addressing your physical stresses in a great way. But let's say you have heavy metals that have stored in your brain or stored in your cells or other toxins that have stored in your body. This is the problem with toxins is that they bioaccumulate over time. Well, that is a massive stressor. It creates the same stress response, creates the same cellular inflammation. And even if you're addressing the first two, that toxic chemical stress can creep up on anybody. So that's one of the upcoming webinars. It's actually the next uh, two webinars after this. The next one is reset your sleep cycles. The one after that, step number five, is detoxify your life, detoxify your body because those toxins bioaccumulate in your body and your life. Get rid of the exposures. Get a water filter. Get an air filter. Get new personal care products. That is webinar number five. But that's really important to know that there are three different types of stress that all create the same stress response. And the problem with all these stresses is that they accumulate as well. It's a concept called allostatic load. An allostatic load, what that means is that stresses accumulate. Okay, so homeostasis, we're gonna look at a slide in a second that's gonna explain homeostasis. Homeostasis is, is pretty much balance. 
allostasis are things that take you away from balance. And you have what's called an allostatic load, which is the accumulative effect of stress after stress after stress. It's not like one stress happens and then it just gets erased. And then the next stress happens and it just gets erased. These stresses continue to accumulate in a process called allostatic load. And it's you know related to or, or, or kind of illustrated by calling it rocks in your backpack. Adding rocks to your backpack. Adding rocks to your backpacks make nothing easier unless you're trying to drown. Everything gets harder as you continue to add rocks to your backpack. Every mental stress, every physical stress, and every toxic chemical stress is adding rocks to your backpack, creating inflammation, zapping your energy, creating hormone disruption, and eventually causing and contributing to disease. That's why this is so important and why if you want to get your energy back, you have to get this under control. So the stressor, the stressor is the cause of the stress. Okay, and so I want to explain just kind of the concept here. A stressor causes a stress response. The stress response creates a hormone cascade. Okay, uh, now what do those hormones mean? There are specific stress hormones. Cortisol is your body's main stress hormone. The next one is, is DHEA, another adrenal hormone. Not so much a, as a stress hormone, but the adrenal, so it can definitely get disrupted when you're under chronic stress. Another one is epinephrine. I put in parentheses there adrenaline because most of us have heard of an adrenaline rush. We've heard of an adrenaline rush, but epinephrine and norepinephrine are the names of the hormones there. And I always remember this because in undergrad, I had a professor uh, of, uh, of physiology who was British. And in Britain, they don't use the word epinephrine and norepinephrine. They call them adrenaline and noradrenaline. And I thought, well, that's easier. Why don't we just call them that here? Everybody's heard of an adrenaline junkie. Everyone's heard of an adrenaline rush. But it's epinephrine and norepinephrine that actually make that happen. The other one along those same lines is what's called dopamine. And, and you know, a lot of times people might think that they're an adrenaline junkie, but they might in reality be a dopamine junkie. But so I want to explain this. A stressor creates a stress response and a hormone cascade. And like I said, that is a healthy, normal response. We want that. And so I want to talk about that for a second. So I always use this analogy. Uh, imagine if you're walking in the woods, you're hiking in the woods or in the mountains, and you run into a bear, okay? So you run into a bear. So right away, is that a stressor? Absolutely. You think of any other thing like this, but something that scares you. And, and a bear is just a great example because it creates a physiology that many of us have maybe heard of, of the terms, but a fight or flight physiology. And that's a smart thing. What that means is you see a bear, your body creates a response, and that response is designed to program you to either fight if you're dumb or flight, run away. You're either, anytime you run into a threat, you're either going to fight it and combat it or you're going to get out of danger, out of harm's way. That's what fight or flight means. It's priming your body for a response fight or flight. So let's think about that. What happens in those in, in those few minutes or few seconds when you see that bear? Well, if I'm going to fight or I'm going to flight, I need my muscles, right? So my, my body is going to take blood away from my internal organs, take it out to my muscles, get my muscles ready for fight or flight. Because at that time, if I've run into a bear, I don't need digestion. I don't need my immune system fighting things. I don't need a sex drive. That serves me no purpose in fighting or flighting. What I need is muscles that can either you know, be sudden or get me out of the situation. So your blood gets shunted out. Your blood pressure goes up because you're about to fight or flight. You need to push blood out to those muscles, get ready to run. Once again, a smart, smart thing. Things happen with your eyes. Your eyesight changes. Your cholesterol 
goes up and clotting factors. Because think about this, if I'm about to either get in a fight with a bear or I'm about to run, my body is preparing me that I might sustain an injury. So cholesterol and clotting factors are going to go up. Once again, really, really smart, smart thing for your body. Because if I get swiped by a bear claw, I don't want to bleed out in the woods. My body is so smart that in a split second, it can prepare my body for that, for fight or flight. This is a very, very intelligent reaction, right? And this is any stressor, your body gets stressed for a reason. So this stress response is genius. And we always talk about the beautiful way that the body was designed. Nothing is by mistake at all. It's just the way that we are living today that is, you know, mistreating us. So now let's think about how we're living today. Like how often do I see a bear? Because let's say I'm living, you know, in my ancestor days, and I see a bear, and I get away from it, and I, I go back to my, my cabin or my cave or whatever, and the bear is gone. So then I go back in out of fight and flight. I go back into rest and digest. I go back into recovery mode. I go back into regenerating mode. I go back into healing mode. My digestion kicks back in. My immune system starts functioning again. My sex drive kicks back in. And that's a balance that we're going to talk about in a second here. But in today's society, the problem with this, remember I said stress is a good thing, but the problem in today's society is that we are constantly stressed. We wake up and maybe we're late for our alarm clock. Stress right away. Or maybe we get, you know, right away in the morning, we can't find the shirt that we're looking for, or whatever the case may be. Usually it's something really minor, but we create that stress response in our brains. Oh my gosh, I'm late for work. Stress response. I eat bad foods. I eat toxic junk foods. You know, what's the staple for breakfast in our country? Grains and dairy, milk and cereal. So you create a physical stressor there that creates a stress response. And so it's continuing to go. Then you're driving to work and maybe you're white knuckling your steering wheel because you're a couple of stressed that whole time. Somebody cuts you off and you want to give them some sign language, stress response, a road rage. You get to the office, you trip over the curb, and after you get mad at the curb and stubbing your toe, stress response. Somebody says something to you the wrong way in the office, stress response. Your boss says, hey, can I see you in my office real quick? Stress response. Once you get in there, you get a scolding, stress response. You go to fast food over lunch, stress response. You get home at the end of the day, you're, there's bills in the mailbox, stress response. You get a fight with your spouse, stress response. Then you sit on your butt and think, I'm so tired, I'm gonna sit down and watch this TV show, stress response. You eat, what do we call them? Comfort foods, because you think, I'm so stressed, I wanna eat this ice cream, I wanna eat this pizza. Stress response, toxic stress, physical stress, mental stress, all day long, every day. And that is the concern, that is the epidemic, that's why today's webinar is so important. We're not going to eliminate all your stresses. We're not going to get you a new job. We're not going to give you a raise. We're not going to give you a new boss or a new spouse or a new car or change your situations. But what you have to do is you have to change the way that you respond to these situations. And then you have to take some action steps to reduce your stress response and reduce your stress hormones. But when that's happening constantly, what happens is da, 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 constant stress leads to constant stress response, which leads to hormone disruption. When that stress response, which remember is a good thing, but when that's happening over and over and over and over again, that is not a good thing. Your body never gets back to the balance. It never gets back to rest and digest. It never gets back to the important functions that keep you healthy. So it causes hormone disruption that lead to things like weight gain. Now that's one example, one big example because it's the most obvious one that if your hormones are disrupted, you gain weight, absolutely it's going to zap your energy. 
I think that weight gain is is you know low on the on the list of severity of the things that this stress response, this hormone cascade, and this hormone disruption can cause. It can cause heart disease. It can cause cancer. It can cause poor sleep. It can cause autoimmune conditions. It can cause brain. I mean, it can cause almost everything. Stress is at the root of many, many, if not all, of our chronic diseases today. Mental, physical, and chemical stresses are at the root. So that's what happens when you continually live this lifestyle. Don't take these action steps. That's why this is such a huge concern, and that's how it can affect your energy. Weight gain just being one very simple example there. So when we look at this as a balance, homeostasis, that word at the top, is a dynamic balance between the, the autonomic branches. And, and what that means, you just have to think of homeostasis means balance. And so when you look at this picture here, this image, it's a balance. It is a teeter-totter. So you can't have both ends of a teeter-totter up at the same time. It just doesn't work that way. So you got to have one up, then the other. And so on one side of this, and I'll pull it back up in a sec, you see the guy running from the snake. Okay, so I use the example of a bear. This guy sees a snake. <gasps> Immediately, stress response. That's the fight flight physiology. Goes up, the other one goes down. Remember I said that's the rest and digest. So the fight or flight is what's called your sympathetic nervous system. Really, really good, really important thing. Controls a, a, just a ton of you know, necessary functions in your body, but constant sympathetic dominance means that your constant your parasympathetic is always muted. And that's your rest and digest. So let me pull this back up here. The rest and digest branch of the nervous system, see that guy's sleeping down there. Fight or flight, your sympathetic activity dominates. Rest and digest, your parasympathetic, parasympathetic activity dominates. And what you want to be is in homeostasis is in a balance. You don't always want to be in rest and digest or just the exact same way that you don't always want to be in fight or flight. It's not about always being anything. It's about a balance and achieving a good balance. So when you get a fight or flight response, your body can adapt and come back down to rest or digest. So those stresses are still going to happen. They're still going to come up but the way that you respond to them and how often they happen and how you can get those hormones down afterward is going to make a world of difference. So five steps to re reduce your stress hormones. Um, and, and so with each one of these, we're going to talk about how they work on these two systems, more so how they stimulate the parasympathetic. Because if you remember, I said that you can't have one up while while the other one is, is is up while one goes up the other one goes down so if you're constantly fighting or flighting over here the way to get that down is one change your response change your mindset you know begin thinking about how grateful you are for things or you know i'm so glad that i got this flat tire this flat tire is going to give me an opportunity to you know whatever uh, that's going to be a tough one to to start to enjoy some of these stressors but you can change the way that you respond. A response is a choice. But you want to minimize that, that response there. But also by kicking up your parasympathetic system, it's going to shut down your sympathetic. Okay, so that's what a lot of these action steps are, are ways to kick up your parasympathetic nervous system so that it reduces these stress hormones. So number one is deep breathing okay and this one is is i put it as number one for a reason because sorry uh because it's the easiest and it's one that you can do anywhere so when you are breathing deep from your diaphragm your diaphragm is what controls your lungs there's a muscle at the base of your ribs that actually pulls your lungs open sucks air in and then as the diaphragm relaxes, you exhale. Your diaphragm is parasympathetic control. 
So by activating the diaphragm, by doing deep diaphragmatic breathing, you immediately shut down the fight or flight system. So there's a lot of things that you can do to read about diaphragmatic breathing. The number one thing that I would say, because you know, I do this often, the number one thing that I would say is there's no article, there's no video that's going to teach you how to do this more than trial and error. When you realize how the di like what the diaphragm is shaped like, you can kind of uh, you know, picture this a little bit more, at least for me, or what it feels like. But when you do this deep breathing, you will feel an immediate response. So the diaphragm, can't really see it right here, but right below my ribs, if you picture my hands as a diaphragm, when I breathe from my diaphragm, it pulls down. And so one of the things that they will teach you to look for is, are you breathing from your belly? Because as the diaphragm pulls down from the rib cage into the abdomen, your belly will come out. So this can be done with kids. You can teach them a little game, like they lay on their back, you put a stuffed animal on their belly, and they wanna see that stuffed animal go up and down as they're breathing. Deep breathing anywhere, it can be done anywhere, it can be done at any time. I will get in different habits at different times of how I implement this. Uh, for a while, I, was, I would try to focus on deep breathing as I drove. And it was great. And, and you just, this is a lot of what meditation, you know, it deals with where you want to clear your mind of anything. Well, you can focus only on your breathing. Think about each breath in, each breath out. And think about using your diaphragm. It will immediately shut down the sympathetic response. My number one suggestion, deep breathing. Another thing that I've done in the past, I haven't been so great at lately, but like I said, I get in different habits and the habits always change as I'm working on something new or something different. But taking uh, you know, five or nine, nine was the number that I was doing, taking nine deep diaphragmatic breaths before every meal. Okay, and, and to go back to the slide, you know, we talked about uh, sympathetic versus parasympathetic, and one is rest and digest while the other is fight or flight. Well, how do we eat most of our meals? Are you, re are you like fully rested and very peaceful when it's time to eat? No, you're usually in a hurry, you're grabbing something on the go, you're going through the drive through you're eating it off your steering wheel, you're eating it off your desk in front of your computer, and you're in sympathetic dominance as you eat. So your body's not resting and digesting uh, the way that it's supposed to. So by doing a quick you know, five to nine diaphragmatic breaths right before a meal, it takes you from sympathetic dominance to parasympathetic dominance, then you can enjoy that meal and your body's going to digest that further. So deep diaphragmatic breathing, one of the biggest things that you can do. If you can create the habit, which it's an easy habit because it's quick, nobody knows that you're doing it. You know, if your boss offends you, go back to your desk, take three deep diaphragmatic breaths. You get in an argument or something happens on the road or you know, whatever X, Y, or Z stressor happens, Take three, take five, take four, and that's just biased on odd numbers. Take a certain number of deep diaphragmatic breaths to shut down the sympathetic activity and kick up the parasympathetic activity. Big, big change anybody can take at any time. Number two is meditation, and I put it on there. Uh, also binaural brain waves. And this is a really, really interesting thing. So meditation, you know, many people have heard of meditation and they don't know exactly what it means. Um, and it's, it's, it's fun. I mean, the, the goal is to quiet your mind. Okay, so it's not necessarily a spiritual thing. It is a nothing thing. It's to quiet your mind. And I think that everybody can agree that in today's society, we just... We never have that opportunity. We never quiet our mind. Most people never take any quiet time, any prayer time, any meditation time. Now, for me, sometimes meditation, prayer can be you know, thought of as one and the same. For me, it's not because prayer is an active conversation between God and myself, uh, and meditation is the opposite. I try to think about nothing. So I try to think about my breathing. I try to clear my mind. There's a lot of good resources out there for meditation, but I would start with you know, a five-minute 
meditation and try to work your way up. One of the concepts that I really enjoyed, which made it more of a game, is that if you, and this is something that I learned from like, I think from Tim Ferriss from the four hour work week and four hour body and et cetera. But he said that if you're doing a 20 minute meditation and say for 17 of those minutes, your mind is wandering. You know, you don't expect your mind to be perfectly, you know, straight and narrow the entire time. It's going to go here. It's going to go here. The point is that you bring it back to nothingness and you bring it back to center. And he said, if you're doing a 20 minute meditation and for 17 of those minutes, you're all over the place. But for the last minute, you bring it back and you wind up, you end your 20 minutes being aligned, being centered, thinking about nothing, then you won that meditation. And when he used that word, that, that sparked my interest because when it's something you can win, I, I, I'm all in. I'm uh, competitive. I want to win at, at things. I'm not like a sore loser by any means. But it makes it a lot more fun when it's something that is kind of a game and it's you versus your mind. And I'll tell you, doing five-minute meditation it is not easy, especially to continue doing it daily. You can set your timer. You can just sit and think about nothing. The binaural brain waves that I'm going to talk about in a second is something that you can combine and do do with meditation. Uh, but yeah, you sit and think about nothing for a set period of time. Maybe you start by going for for one minute. And what I would say though is five minutes. It might sound intimidating, but who doesn't have five minutes to spare? You know, wake up five minutes earlier, you know, go finish your lunch break five minutes sooner and go sit in a quiet place, take five minutes to meditate. The other one, I'm going to put it back up here just for the spelling, is binaural brain waves. And what that means is uh, these are different brain waves that can elicit certain brain states, okay? And that sounds maybe kind of hokey or kind of weird, um, but it's, it's fascinating. Um, and so these are different waves, and, and they're, they're apps, and they're, they're audio. So these are the brain waves, and, and I'm, I'm kind of pulling it up on my phone right here to show you guys and to explain it, because this is something that basically you wear headphones, and the, 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 there's a noise in one ear and a noise in the other ear, and the difference between those two stimulates different brain waves. So if you didn't know, you have different brain waves, alpha waves, theta waves, delta waves that are part of different brain states. One is like, you know, deep relaxation. One is, you know, concentration. One is deep sleep, et cetera, et cetera. And you can stimulate those brain waves. You can artificially do them with binaural brain waves. So this is something that I've gotten into recently. An app on my phone, downloaded it for like, you know, two ninety nine dollars or something. Um, and, and by the way, I've had patients get the free version and it was not good. It was really hard. So spend the three bucks, get the binaural, binaural beats, uh, binaural brain waves. Mine is called Brainwave. Brainwave. It has 32 different binaural programs. And I'll just read these real quick. Um, so one is morning coffee. Okay, morning coffee. I'm going to hit the info really quick. It is designed to ease your mind into the day and bring you to a heightened state of mental focus or awareness. So I'll use them for those things. But for what we're talking about right now, there's a morning meditation. Here is a creativity boost. Here's stress reduction. That's a binaural program that's on this app that you put in headphones for a couple minutes, 20 minutes. I'll do these while I'm driving to work turn the radio off, just go in silence with just my brain waves to help put my brain into that state of relaxation, kicks up the parasympathetic, lowers the sympathetic, and puts your body into that balance. So brain wave, binaural brain waves, it's an app, it's an audio thing that you can get. Uh, something that I've really been into lately and something that I would encourage. Quick and easy, something to have on you at all times uh, to help put yourself into parasympathetic dominance or control your brain states a little bit more. Number three is prayer and faith. And I put that because, you know, prayer by itself is the action of, you know, communicating with God, but it's, it's really faith that, you know, can reduce stress. Because when you have faith that, you know, you're, you're part of a, a purpose greater than yourself, when you have faith that 
you know, somebody's watching them over you, and you have faith that you are in love, and you have faith that everything is happening for a reason, it just changes the way that you respond to things. So I'm not saying, you know, I'm a Christian, but I'm not saying that you have to have any specific faith or set of beliefs, but having a set of beliefs makes a huge difference. Instead of everything is random, I don't know what's going to happen to me, blah, blah, blah. When you know that you're part of a grander scheme, you know that everything is connected, you know that everything is happening for a reason. It just allows you to take a stressor and think about it in a different light. Think about why, why God are you using this situation? Why are you using this loss of a loved one, this loss of my job? What are you, what are you doing? What are you up to? I know that it's for the greater good, so I'm not going to stress about it. But what are you doing here? And knowing that, having that kind of faith, having that kind of communication and talking about it you know, to your source, to God, to a greater being, um, magically, magically reduces your stress response and the way that you really view the world. So I, I think that that's a really important part. It's definitely an important part of my life, and I would encourage it, you know, for everybody else too. The next two are really fun. Number four is good sleep. Okay, so good sleep. There are really, you know, there's one thing that I didn't put on here because it's the last webinar. But when you have high sympathetic uh, and, you know, your hormones, the hormones are circulating. The, you have that sympathetic response, that high cortisol, that high epinephrine, more epinephrine, the high stress hormones. There are three things that really help metabolize and break down those stress hormones really well. One is exercise. Okay, so hard exercise, really, you know, even uh, like we talked about in the last webinar, four, five, 12, 20 minute exercise breaks down those stress hormones. You get a temporary spike in stress hormones from exercise, but the end result is it metabolizes the stress hormones better, makes your body more hormone sensitive, really helps. But the other two that really break down stress hormones are good sleep and laughter. So good sleep is actually our next webinar. Because think about it, this is 10 steps to renew your energy. And this is probably the most obvious, most common cause of low energy, of fatigue, is not enough sleep. We've all experienced this, where you just didn't sleep well the night before, you get two nights of bad sleep in a row, and your cognitive abilities just decline. You can't think, somebody asks you your name or your address, and, huh? You know, and, and that happens from poor sleep. So getting a good night's sleep breaks down these stress hormones. Now in today's webinar, I'm not gonna go into how you can get a good night's sleep because that is the next webinar. Step number four is reset your sleep cycles. We're gonna go into that in detail. And what are the cycles? What's stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four? Your REM sleep, what's melatonin? How does cortisol, the stress hormone, how does it, how does it affect it? But I'll tell you, it's a vicious cycle. You get stressed, you spike cortisol, you have hormone imbalances with your cortisol, that throws off your sleep cycles. Cortisol, the main stress hormone, is a key player in your sleep cycles. So stress creates poor sleep, poor sleep creates stress, and so on and so forth. It is a vicious cycle that you have to break by learning how to get a good night's sleep. And then number five is laughter, which what a, what a fun one, right? Laughter breaks down and metabolizes stress hormones. So this is no joke. I will give this to patients as a prescription all the time. Watch a funny show. Watch a funny movie. My wife and I will literally watch stand-up comedies as a prescription, as something that's therapeutic. We had a long, stressful day. Put something funny on. And think about this. We all know this. Like, How stressed are you when you're laughing? You know, you're not, you know, your stress is the, the world is still around you. All those things still exist. But, you know, I love seeing, seeing pictures of like, you know, kids in Haiti or, or somewhere where the horrible things are happening and they're just cracking up laughing. They're just loving life. So they're not stressed in that moment. Sure, they have stressful situations. Sure, they, they have, you know, horrible settings and hygiene and, and living conditions and financial conditions and all these things that create such a stressful environment, but they're laughing their way 
through. And that's one of the biggest things to combat stress. So say you are, you know, a single adult and your workplace, you know, nobody's funny there. Uh, I don't want to pick on any, any workforce. I was going to give an example, say you're like an accountant or somewhere where it's really dry, but that's not very true. My accountant's really funny. My sister's an accountant. She's really funny. Uh, so not trying to stereotype any one particular office, but let's say you're just not getting enough laughter and you're, you're single. So you come home, you're not having a lot of conversations, you know, don't flip on, you know, the news. We already talked about that as a cause of stress. Flip on something funny that's going to break down your stress hormones, lower your stress hormones. Now, in the next webinar, I'll talk about another action step you can do. Put on your blue blockers, sit down, and watch a funny show. Right before you go to bed, decrease those stress hormones, help reset your sleep cycles, help change your energy, change your hormones. It's not going to happen overnight. Now, immediately, your stress hormones are reduced. But you continue doing that as part of a habit. Your hormone sensitivity improves. Your hormone levels improve. You start to lose weight. You start to get a better night's sleep. You start to have more energy. Maybe you use that more energy to get to the gym or to do a workout in the morning. The vicious cycle is called that because it just keeps going and going and going and self-perpetuating. But so is the opposite. Once you start the good cycle, you break that vicious cycle and you start a healthy cycle. It, one thing leads to another, and it's a snowball effect of positive thing after positive thing. So number five is good, hard laughter. So stay tuned. These are basic steps that everybody should take. You know, this is something that you could do all five of these in a daily basis. Say you, you start off the morning. And, and, and you know, these are our five things that I try to do on, on a daily basis. So let me tell you how I put these into play. So let's say I start off the morning, you know, prayer is part of my morning routine. So it's quiet time, but not always, but prayer is always part of my morning routine. I do that in the shower. So starting off the day with gratitude, with thankfulness, and with requests of, of you know, blessings and, and other things, uh, forgiveness, you know, lots of different things that help reduce stress. Then let's say I go to work, maybe on the way to work, I listen to binaural brain waves while I try to diaphragmatically breathe. I turn off the radio. I, I don't have any other stressors coming in. And, and uh, just to mention that real quick with, uh, uh, because I just thought of it, you know, we're talking about turning off the radio and, and, and some people will say, well, I like background noise. Well, your brain doesn't. You might think you like background noise. Your brain does not want the radio playing while the TV's on, while your kids are talking, while you're at your computer. You might have led yourself to believe that you work better in that way. Like a lot of people have led themselves to believe that they're great multitaskers, but the studies don't lie. Your brain does not function as well while it's multitasking. So if you have a ton of sensory inputs, you've got... You know, you're looking at the road while you drive. You've got your radio on. You've got your headphone in listening to a conference call at the same time. That's a lot of sensory input. That's stress. But anyway, so maybe on the way to work, you turn your radio off. You have your headphones in for your binaural beats. There's no sound, so you're not like, distracting yourself from the road. Um, and you're diaphragmatically breathing while you drive. So then you work. Then you get a lunch break. First off, on your lunch break, we've already listened to, to webinar number one and webinar number two. So I skipped the workout. Maybe you get a workout in the morning. Then over your lunch break, you need a healthy lunch. You're not trying to add chemical stress on top of your physical and emotional stresses. So you eat a, a real food, healthy lunch. Then maybe you take five minutes to do a meditation. You take five minutes to just sit and think about nothing, try to quiet your mind, try to have a competition between you and your mind, and you try to win. Then you go home. And because it was a particularly stressful day, you put on a stand-up comedy. You watch your favorite show. You get some kind of some some comedy, you know, audio that you listen to, and you get some good laughs. And you go out with your friends. You, you know, you get good social interactions. That's another great way to reduce stress hormones. Social interactions. So you get that number five. You get that laughter. Then you you cap it all off with a good night's sleep. That is something right there on a daily basis. You can use all five of these action steps. You can use three of them. You can use the other two the next day. You can mix and match them. 
You can Google and learn more. There's a, a ton of ways to reduce your stress. These are just five of the easiest. But if you implement those as habits, like the exercise, like the diet, those these first three webinars become a habits, become part of your lifestyle, you are dramatically, dramatically reducing your overall stress, your allostatic load, the rocks in your backpack, and the hormone disruption, the weight gain, the low energy, and the eventually chronic disease that comes from this. So taking these action steps, massively, massively important. So stay tuned. Uh, these are basic steps that everybody should take. And like I said at the beginning, if you have been chronically stressed long enough, it will disrupt these hormones and, it, and you may need to look further. So if this has been a problem, like let's say you've had a stressful job and stressful relationship, and usually you know, if you have one stress, you're going to have more than, more than one. So if you have stressful finances, you're probably going to have a stressful job and stressful relationship, et cetera. Let's say you've been like this for a decade or two decades. You've been chronically stressed long enough. There is a time and a place that you have to look further. That's webinar number seven, digging a little bit deeper into adrenal fatigue, supporting your adrenal glands, and what's called HPA access system. How do we test for that? How do we treat that? How do we support that through our diet and through our supplements? So for anybody else, everybody should do these. But for those of you who still are low energy, still fatigued, still have you know metabolic problem, still have weight to lose, this isn't a, a magic bullet. It's just a start. Step number one, eat a real food diet. Step number two, exercise regularly. Step number three, reduce your stress hormones. That is a great place to start. But like I said, it's not a magic bullet. It's not going to immediately make your diagnosed diseases go away, make your 50 extra pounds go away, make your medications go away. Sometimes it takes a step further to go there. And that would be something like HPA access lab testing, one of the most important labs that anybody could do, um, and supplemental support to support the adrenals. So stay tuned for step number seven. For that, support your adrenal glands and HPA access. But otherwise, the next webinar is going to be step number four, reset your sleep. Such an important topic. I say that every time, but all of these are so important. And I really truly believe that if you take you know, these 10 webinars and you take even just a few of the bits and pieces and the gems that you're learning from these, you implement them into your daily life, you're going to not only regain your energy, regain your life, recharge your batteries, your brain, your adrenal glands, fix hormone problems. If you take all 10 of them and put them into action, you are headed towards an ideally healthy life. But at the same time, with every webinar, we want to close by saying, it's not that easy you know, for most people. You can watch these 10 webinars and you can try all 10 things and, and you still might be missing pieces here or there and not moving in the direction. Or you might be doing things wrong, you might misinterpret things. That's the time that you need a coach. You need somebody to help put the pieces of your puzzle together. You need somebody who's taken or who, who's going to take a, a detailed health history. You need somebody as an accountability partner. And you need somebody, like I said, to put the pieces of the puzzle together for you. In my career, I've done health intakes, health histories on well over a thousand people. Uh, and, and it helped a lot of people lose a lot, lot of weight, get off a lot of medications, overcome chronic diseases, and just have you know a lot of experience working with people, helping them uncover their big why, and then helping them put the pieces of their puzzle together. So if that's something that you're interested in, I'm gonna pull this up again that has my email on there that you can send me an email if you have a question, or if you go to www.realhealthresource.com, that is the resource for all of our resources. It has our podcasts, has these webinars, has our blog articles, has our supplement store, has our lab testing, has everything that you need as a resource there to educate yourself. But it also has the information on real health 
coaching. And that's one-on-one -on -one coaching with myself. You get two monthly video calls, just like we're doing here, talking to you. You get a, a detailed health history and a plan of action. You get 10% off any supplements that you buy through our store. You get 10% off any lab testing that you decide to do. So that is something that I strongly encourage. If you feel like you know, you've gotten to step one, step two, step three, and you think, wow, I, I need something else. I don't need another doctor. I don't need another treatment. I don't need another medication. What I need is a coach. And, and coach, you know, Tiger Woods has a coach. LeBron has a coach. The best athletes have a coach. Anybody that wants to get better in any area of their life needs a coach. I have several coaches in different areas of my life that I want to improve on. So I want to encourage you, www.realhealthresource.com or send me an email, drtaylor at realhealthresource.com. But otherwise, stay tuned for the upcoming webinars. Hope you got something out of this. And more than anything, hope that you take some of these steps and you implement them because I know that I do and I know that it has definitely impacted my life in a positive way. And I don't know where I'd be without some of these action steps. So make sure that you give them all a try.